Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on the internet and whatever continent and time zone you're in. Welcome into our study, Living Like You Belong to God by Kay Arthur and David and B.J. Lawson. Uh, we are currently on the penultimate lesson, which is lesson five of six, and I just want to read for you what is our beginning opening statement. Be holy because I am holy. As those who belong to God, we are called to the practice of holiness. The call is based on the character of God himself. This week, we'll consider further what it looks like to practice holiness in our dealings with others. That's kind of an important thing to be knowing. And I'm going to welcome my sister in this morning. And we shall get started with prayer and there she is good morning Ren good morning so this is our study living like you belong to God we're just about finished we have one more week to complete it we're glad that everyone joined us here <clears throat> and of course we always start with prayer Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you welcome us into your throne room <clears throat> where we can sit at your feet and learn from you. You've commanded us to be holy as you are holy. And that is a foreign term in our world. So I just, Lord, expect that you will teach us today, that you will instruct us on what that means and what our lives should look like, what our conduct in this world should be in just such a time as this. So please take this time and use it to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now, I am expecting some other people to join us in this room. And so when that happens and they ring in, I may just pause. So here we are. We are on page 57 of our text. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to read the, ver oh, well, with our inductive study, we always have a pen in hand. And we're if ready. not more. <laughs> yes. And uh, what we're going to look at today is uh, 1 Corinthians 3, <clears throat> excuse me, verses 16 to 17. And we're going to read them aloud, and we are going to underline every occurrence of the word temple, and we're going to draw a cloud around the word holy. So here we go. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 to 17. You can read, Adrian. Okay. Do you not know that you are a temple mm. of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy. And that is what you are. Mm. Okay. So what did we, what did we learn from marking temple? We should have read 1 Corinthians 6, 19, too. We're not there yet. Okay. Oh, what did we learn from marking temple there? Um, That we are a temple of God, and mm -hmm. the Spirit dwells in us. So the, the human being, the human being who is um, in Christ Jesus is God's temple. And what happens in that temple? God dwells in it. Spirit yes. of God dwells in it. Yes, good. All right. Uh, let's go. Okay, so what else do we learn about this temple? That if any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the temple of God is holy. Mm -hmm. And? That is what we are. That is what we are. Okay. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. For do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? I'm just going to cloud that whole thing. 
temple of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Who is in you, whom you have from God. Whom? Whom? Better mm -hmm. mark whom. And no, no, we're not marking spirit. Okay. And I. Whom you have from God and that you are not on your own. Okay. So what do... All right. So what do we learn here again from 1 Corinthians? That we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes. And where is the Holy Spirit? In us. Mm -hmm. Now, who is he speaking to? Okay, so he's speaking 1 Corinthians, right? And so who is he speaking to? When he's writing this, who? Who is the sub... Uh, the uh, Believers. Is, yes, believers in Corinth. <clears throat> so this is not a blanket statement for everyone walking on the world, in the earth. No. They have the potential to be so, but they are not so until they are believers in, in Christ. Okay, so what word does 1 Corinthians 3.17 use to describe the temple of God? Holy. Mm -hmm. The temple of God is holy. So how does that designation apply to you or to me? As believers, we are the temple of God. Yes. And thus we yes, are. Children of God. What, and thus we are I'm, holy. I'm just, yes. Thus we are holy. That, so I'm just, when I ask you those kind of questions, I'm pro I'm prompting you to go back to the text and answer me from. Yeah, the I realized that. <laughs> And that's what Took we do. Me a second, though. Yeah, and that's what we do when we are inductive Bible students. We are trying to uh, draw from the context that we're reading from. Okay, we're flipping the page, and now, oops, sorry, I got too much on my desk here. It's taking up space. Oh dear. All right. Now we're going to read uh, Romans chapter one, verse seven. And 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2, we are marking, uh, all, we're underlining all the phrases to all who are beloved of God and to the church of God, okay? And we're going to draw a cloud around the occurrence of the word saints. Okay. Romans 1. To all who are beloved of God in Roman, in Rome, sorry. So we're underlining that to all who are beloved of God in Rome. Called as saints. Cloud. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good. All right. Now the first Corinthians one. To the church of God, mm -hmm. which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, Oh. Saints. Okay. By calling with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Now, just wait a minute. I'm going to underline those who have been sanctified in Christ. Because that uh, this is a specific, uh, these are both specific letters to specific people. Or groups of people, let's just say. Okay. All right, so saints. All right, so I want you to read what's in the inside box there, please. Saint means one who is holy or set apart. The term implies separation and devotion to the service of God. So where did we get that idea at in this study so far? I'm trying to remember. Who did God say, you shall be holy for I am holy to, in the first? The disciples. No, in the first, at the first, at the first of God speaking to humanity. Who did he say that? You shall be holy for I am holy. Adam. Not to Adam. Then I'm confused. That was when Moses. Oh, yes. Right? And yeah. Moses. Took the people out of Egypt and God gave them the law on tablets of stone. 
And he said, you shall be holy for I am holy. So he, he, he chose those people and said, you shall be holy. And we learned what holy means. What does holy mean? Uh-oh. To go back and look at it. Well, no, just look right remember. here. Right in the insight box. No, that's saint. Saint means one who is holy. Oh, yes. Or set, set apart. apart. Yes, good. Yeah. All right, good. All right, so who is Paul addressing in each of these verses? So who did he who did he say in Romans 1? He was writing this the letter. The beloved of God in Rome. In Rome. And what are they? What are they? They're called Saints. as. Saints. Yes. And then in 1 Corinthians, who was he to writing? The Church to? of God in Corinth. Mm -hmm. And uh, he further uh, expands on um, that. To those who have been sanctified in Christ. And they're called. Saints. Yes. And. Who else does he say in 1 Corinthians? All who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Their Lord Within and ours. ours. Yes. So does that leave anybody, anytime, anywhere out? No. Well, no. yeah, if you're not a believer. That's right. Who have been sanctified in Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Who in every place call. So whoever calls upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and ours. That's who he's writing to. Good. So do you think of yourself as a saint? Why or why not? Oh, my name is St. Louis. <laughs> and yours You're is St. Winnie. Saint. You're a city in a state. <laughs> That's a joke, everyone. That's my uh, my my pet name from uh, just my f closest friends. You're not allowed to use it. My closest friends and family call me Louis. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I'm Saint Louis. <laughs> so, do you think of yourself as a saint? I don't know. Never thought about it. You never thought about it. Well, never in, really some, thought. In, in some, uh, let's say, in some um, circles, I'm going to say circles, uh, saints are particularly uh, revered people who are dead. Then you don't get to become a, a saint until you're dead. Uh, and um, you're dead. I'm not saint. dead. I'm not dead yet. <laughs> it <ain't> much better. <laughs> okay, that's enough levity in our Bible study. Um, uh, okay, so that so people get an idea that saints and then there's statues and all of that kind of stuff. I don't think anybody's going to make a statue to me. <laughs> and uh, what uh, what we have here is the Apostle Paul telling us who saints are. Those who are beloved of God, they're called as saints. These ones happen to be Rome because he's writing to the Romans, right? But these ones here are in Corinth. And they're called also the Church of God. And he spe specifies that they've been sanctified in Christ. So I never really thought of myself as a saint either in terms of uh, what... <clears throat> kind of worldly definitions there are of saints. Um, sometimes I don't really act like all that saintly. <laughs> but what does God call us? Saints, because we're set apart. We're set apart. So let's just go where the rubber hits the road. If you are a saint, how should that knowledge impact your daily life? Should live like that. Yes. So does that mean we walk around like a statue with robes and a halo of light around our heads? No. Well, then tell me. Mm. 
No, that's that that would be ridiculous. Okay, so let's go back to the insight. So <clears throat> we should be in constant devotion to the service of God, even in oh. our daily life. Okay, I'm going to pause right here because Pam's coming in. Pause. So here we are. We're back and we welcome Pam into the room. And we just had a little chuckle because we reviewed uh, all that we have just studied before, only much more quickly. And the question is, do you think of yourself as a saint and why or why not? And then we had already discussed that. So we're going to go on. But because... The rubber hits the road question is this. If you are a saint, how should that knowledge impact your daily life? And so that, I mean, like we can just leave that hanging out there unless, Adrian, you want to pipe up or? It, it should, we should be living in service for God all, uh, every day. Mm -hmm. And what? We we marked this uh, insight box, which saint means one who is holy or set apart. This term implies separation from whatever went before or the world around us and devotion to the service of God. So that's what the saint is. So So then that knowledge impacts our daily life in that. Our lives should look different from other people's. Well, from people just who aren't saints, let's just say, who are not called of Jesus Christ. Okay, we're going to go on to the next part, Pam. Look up 1 John 1, 5 to 7 in your, in your scripture. And Adrian is going to read it here as it is in our textbooks because <clears throat> they've taken them apart for us. And what we're going to do is... We're going to observe the apostle John wrote a clear description of God's character and what that means for those who worship him. So we're going to read first John one that's near the back. It's almost first, the second, third John Jude and revelations near the back of the Bible. We're going to read that Adrian's going to read it aloud. And while we are reading, we're going to mark every reference to God including pronouns with a triangle. So we're going to learn about God in this. Adrienne, are you ready? Oh, <coughs> we'll come back to the, sorry. We'll come back to the insight box later. Okay. This is the message we have heard from him. That's God. And announced to you that God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his Son cleanses us from all sin. Good. Very good. <clears throat> so we're going to read it one more time. And we marked this all. Do it again, Adrian. What are we doing? Just read again, please. Okay. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful passage. Okay, read to me the insight box there, Adrian. In the Bible, light is often a symbol of God and his holiness while darkness represents evil and sin. So I'm, I'm considering, <clears throat> okay, I'm just considering um, some people that I know of who believe that they are what I'm, what they call, they call themselves light workers. According okay. to the Bible, what is light? What does it say there? God's holiness. God and his holiness, while darkness represents evil and sin. 
<clears throat> and so we, we, uh, I'm here to refute, um, false, false religions and all of that too. We are talking about God almighty here. All right, let's see what the question says. So what did we learn about God in verse five? And what does that mean? Okay. Verse five. That God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Mm -hmm. So where do we get light? From God. Yes. And in him there is no darkness. And if the symbol of light and darkness is holiness as opposed to evil and sin, there's no sin in God at all. No evil in God at all. Okay, so what did uh, what did we learn about the relationship between God and believers? And then we're to explain how this relates to what we've seen in the study so far. Okay, so what do we learn about the relationship between God and believers? That as long as we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus. His son cleanses us from all sin. Okay, but let's go before that. What does it say in verse 6? That if we walk, that if we have fellowship with him. Well, I'll read it carefully. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Okay, so stopping right there. So this is a, okay, grammatically speaking, this is a, a contrast. Uh, it's like one of those if then statements. So there's an if I'm going to mark it so that you can see it. If we say that we have fellowship with him, that's God. And yet, so that's the then, right? Walk in the darkness. And what is darkness equated to? Evil and sin. Then if, if, if we say that we have fellowship with God and yet we're walking in darkness, what is our issue? We lie and do not practice the truth. Ooh, that's pretty heavy. And it, then... Can I speak? Yeah. Um, and in my, my version here, verse 5, um, and, and, the, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Is that, for, is that first John? Yeah. Uh, no. Well, no, you're John. you're in the no, you're in the gospel. So you have yeah, that's a in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That that's the different John. So first John is the one that's near the back of the Bible, near Revelation. Oh okay. so you're looking at the a different passage. Which is still there which is go. still yeah. applicable because uh yeah, because it's calling Jesus. Okay, so, but I want to point us out here. So, this is very important. So, in our version here, if we're not, if we're walking in sin, and that's not our definition of sin, that's God's definition of sin, which He gave us in His Word, He gave us in His commandments. So, if we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And then there's that big word, the connecting word, but, okay, so, so there's a contrast here and I'm marking, like I mark contrast so that I can see it. So that's if, so this is one state of being, right? And then this is the second state of being, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, so that's talking about God, God is light and in him, there's no darkness at all. We have what? Fellowship with one another. And, and the blood of Jesus is on, his son cleanses us from all sin. Beautiful. So <clears throat> cleanses us from all sin. That means holiness. I want to make a, a little thing clear going back here because there is something here that's important to point out. So back to the if statement in verse six, if we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. This is the, this is the verb. We do not practice the truth. If we're still walking in sinful ways, we're not practicing the truth. 
but we can have fellowship with one another because, oops, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. That's called holiness. And that's what we've been talking about in this study <clears throat> all along in the weeks before. And as I mentioned, pa Pam, at the uh, outset of this lesson, this is lesson five of six, so we're almost finished this little bit of a study, which is a topical study, meaning we're taking, we're studying the topic, and the topic is, um, what is it? Living like you belong to God. Okay, let's go on. Now we're going back to John, the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, where you were before, Pam, only we're in chapter 8, verse 12. Yeah. <clears throat> And uh, we're going to have Adrian read it from our top, uh, our copy here, because that's what we have on tap. All right. So uh, we are going to, eight, okay, so. Eight, twelve. Yeah, chapter eight. So uh, in this observation, John 8 records part of Jesus's public teaching in the temple area during the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles, uh, well, it's not the same as the Feast of Booths, is it? Anyway, at this time, we have to go back and then study the feast. At this time, the large lamps were burning in remembrance of God's leading the Israelites out of the wilderness by a pillar of fire. What an object lesson. Well, and in my personal study, uh, this past month, well, all of this month, we're in February and we're in 2023 this year. Um, <clears throat> 2024, sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, I have been reading in Exodus, so I have just been reading all of this. Um, it's in remembrance of God's leading the Israelites, the Israelites out of the wilderness by a pillar of fire. He led them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And if that cloud moved, they packed up and left. And if it didn't move, they camped there. Okay, so Adrian's going to read John 8. 12 and we're going to mark every reference to Jesus including his pronouns with a cross we're going to draw a semicircle over every occurrence of the word light all right now uh, for Pam and for those who are just joining us for the first time we don't mark our scriptures for the sake of scriptures we're looking for key words those key words uh, give us um understanding as to the content in our observation because without good observation we cannot make good application of the text so we're learning what we can about these particular keywords of course jesus god holy spirit are always keywords in the bible <laughs> <clears throat> but we marked those uh in the previous parts of the of the scripture that we were looking at okay adrian read for me please then jesus Again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. I love that statement. I love finding all of the uh, I am statements that Jesus made in the New Testament as to who he is. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. So, so that's what we learned about Jesus. <laughs> what did we learn? Who is he? The light of the world. And? He who follows and the light of life. Yes. So Jesus is yes. the light of the world and the light of life. <clears throat> From all that we have seen in scripture, what distinguishes a believer's lifestyle from that of the world around him or her? Are believers stumbling around in the dark? No. And the dark is represents? Evil and sin. Evil and <clears throat> sin. Right. So evil. the difference, yeah. The difference between a believer's lifestyle and an unbeliever's lifestyle is whether they're wandering around, uh, wallowing in sin. Okay, good. Now we're going to look at a passage in which Paul addressed the believers in Ephesus who were learning how to live a holy lifestyle. And um, I don't know if, okay, 
I'm going to remind you again that I don't preview what's in this book. And the reason I don't preview it is so that you out there who are watching can understand that is that you could do my job just as easily as I'm doing right here. All you have to do is read <laughs> and ask the questions that are in the text and you, you too could do this. All right. So we're going to read Ephesians 5, 8 to 13 aloud. And we're going to draw a semicircle as before over every occurrence of the word light. And we're going to underline each instruction. And uh, instructions are generally going to come as verbs. So we're going to be looking for that. All right. And this flips over from page 61 to page 62 in our text as we go. So Ephesians, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Act, Epistle of the Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. So it's somewhere in the middle of the New Testament there, if you're looking for that, Pammy, or anyone else who's looking for it in their own Bible. All right, it's to the right. <laughs> Ephesians 5, 8 to 13, and Adrian's going to read, and we are going to mark. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are in the light. You are light in the Lord. Walk as children. Oh, walk. So that's an underline. Sorry, I forgot it. Light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Next page. Mm -hmm. Trying to learn what is pleasing. Okay, learn, to... learn, learn. That's, learn. A, that's a verb. Learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate. Okay, so that is a negative in the fruit for deeds of darkness but instead even expose them that's the verb okay why for it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret but all things become visible when they are exposed by the light for everything that comes becomes visible is light. Okay. All right. This, so this is a little bit chewy. Uh, I want to go back. What does it say? So we're, uh, first of all, let's look at what it says here. What was the contrast that Paul made in verse eight, which is on the previous page of our text? Oh, it's that we were formerly darkness, but now we are in light. Good. So formerly, yes. Okay. So we find the contrast by the word, but so formerly, but now good. We were formerly darkness, but now we are light. Good in the Lord. All right. What instruction did he give in connection with that contrast? So what did, verb did we underline back there? Walk as children of light. Yes. Walk as children of uh, light. So um, if you're thinking of this in simplistic terms, uh, you know, we, ha we have ways of getting around on our feet. We walk, we run, we skip, we hop. <laughs> and what is this kind of metaphorically speaking uh, of walking? Walk as children of light. A journey, or your life journey. Mm -hmm. That's right. Our life journey should be as children of light. And then he gives an explanation of what that looks like. So what is the explanation? For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Okay. And so we find goodness and righteousness and truth um, that is from the Lord. Those are the things that the Lord has given us. That's who he is. And then what was the second verb? Learn. Yes. Trying to learn what? What is pleasing to the Lord. How do we do that? By not, by not participating in fruitful deeds of darkness. Unfruitful deeds expose them. Yeah. So how do we, 
So how do we know what's the unfruitful deeds of darkness? How do we know that? The Holy Spirit will tell us. But what does and the so Holy will the Bible? What does the Holy Spirit speak? Truth. But where does he get truth? The Bible. Yes. Because the Bible is God's word. It's the word of Christ. The whole Bible from beginning to end is the word of Christ to us. And so we learn what is pleasing to the Lord when we learn the Bible. And we listen to the Holy Spirit speak that tr truth back to us. All right. So that was... Um, so... Uh, discuss each aspect of this new lifestyle as listed in verses 9 to 11 and how it should look in the life of a believer. So you said this, uh, so we don't participate, right, in the unfruitful deeds of darkness. And instead? Expose it. Uh, is that going to make us popular? Oh, no. <laughs> Why not, Ren? Because popularity means nothing if we are in to a believer. What happens if it means when you're being in the world? What what happens when you expose dark deeds? You get <laughs> the darkness doesn't like coming in the light <laughs> sometimes, no. right? Oh, so so that may mean that uh, you're not popular. Uh, according to verse, okay, so new, okay, verse 11, what were these new believers to do? They weren't to Expose participate. the darkness. Yes. So uh, that means in ourselves as well, right? That's being honest with God, honest to God. All right. So what is the result of light shining in a person's heart? All things become visible. Yes. All things become visible when they're exposed by the light for everything that becomes visible is light. You can see things for what they are according to God's word, right? And how does the, how is it described about uh, the, the things that are done by secret in the dark? They're disgraceful. Yeah. It's disgraceful even to speak of the things. So that's why, you know, um, you know, sometimes you're in the world in a ministry like, uh, for example, I am and you are, Adrian, and we're looking at disgraceful, despicable, ungodly things. And you, you almost feel like you have to have a shower afterwards because they're so terrible. And tear your it, eyes out. <laughs> yeah, tear your eyes out. Take them out. <gasps> Well, you know, wash them off. Good. Uh, I just had a, a woman explaining to me that that's how she felt from uh, seeing some of the horrible things that are going on in schools that she had no idea and that she realizes that most people do not real know this. So anyway, then we'll go back to our study. Now we are going back to observe. And here it is. It says in Leviticus, God told the Israelites to be holy for I am holy. And remember, I just said that. <laughs> it's in Leviticus as well as Exodus. Now, we as believers are told to walk as children of light, which we just read. Is it really the same thing? Oh, it is really the same thing. <laughs> that was not a question. It was a statement. We already read Ephesians 5, 9, which describes the fruit of the light. In Galatians 5, Paul contrasted walking in the flesh with walking in the spirit. He also described the fruit of those who walk in the Spirit. So this is wonderful. We're at the fruit of the Spirit passage. Galatians 5, 22 to 25. And we're going to underline the word fruit. And we're going to number each fruit of the Spirit. The first one's marked for us in our text. But in case you're marking at home. So let us read that, Mrs. Adrian. Galatians but 5. The... Sorry. Okay. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Oops, that's three. patience, yeah. Four. kindness, five, 
goodness, six, six. faithfulness, seven, seven, gentleness, eight, eight. self-control, nine. nine. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Okay, so we got these fruit. Who produces this fruit, the believer or the Spirit? Whose fruit spirit. is it? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Took me a second. Yeah. So this is not something we drum up on our own. This is not something that we cultivate. Well, we could cultivate. No, that's not the word I meant to say. It's not something that we uh, work at to produce. It's something that the spirit produces in us. Oh, and I just told you the answer. Discuss how this fruit is how this fruit is produced <laughs> blah 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 all right what's on the next page okay so uh adrian read the insight box for us okay love self-sacrificing for the benefit of the one loved joy a deep inner rejoicing that doesn't depend on circumstances peace an inner quietness even in the face of difficult circumstances patience Long-suffering, self-restraint when provoked. Kindness, a disposition that is mellow, not harsh and cutting. Goodness, doing good to others even when it is not deserved. Faithfulness, trustworthy or reliable. Gentleness, right use of power and authority. Considerate of others even when discipline is needed. Self-control, controlling one's actions, feelings, impulses, etc. Ooh, that's quite a quite a list. That's those are the fruit of the spirit: love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. What should this fruit look like in the life of believer, and how should it be lived out? So what should people, what should, what should the habit of our lives be beginning to look like? I'm trying to think of a way to put it. Well, are we, are we, uh, okay, let's start at the bottom. Self-control, controlling one's actions, feelings, impulses, etc. Does that mean we're just all willy nilly? No, no, no. Emotional bat, uh, emotional, uh, drama all the time. No, 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 no. Okay. All right. So that's not something that should be seen all of that. So gentleness, um, um, say you have to correct somebody. Is that going to be... Are you going to be smacking them with uh, sticks and whatnot? No. Yelling and screaming? No. Gentleness. Uh, faithfulness. So uh, when people ask us to do something, what are we doing about keeping our word? Always keep your word. Yes. Hey, this goodness one. Um, so uh, Buddy Boy is a real pain in the neck and he's very uh, whatever. Does that mean we uh, do wicked things back? No. Doing good to others, even when it's not deserved. Okay. Um, in the kindness one, it's talking about a disposition. That's an inner person. It means that we're not cutting and harsh. 
Although I must say, sometimes the truth seems harsh to people who are not used to hearing it. <laughs> yeah. Right. So all of these things, patience. I mean, I, I'll tell you what, you know, uh, I had to work for many years in children's ministry to learn patience. Some people have to be sick for a long time to learn patience or have debilitating or uh, grinding, painful things going on to learn patience. Learning peace. Um, now, where does that happen? Where does peace happen? Inside. Yes, it's inner quietness. And you know you have peace when everything around you is flying apart, right? Everybody's going nuts around you. Okay, really good. All right, let's go back to our observation, shall we? Uh, now we are at Matthew 5, verses 43 to 48. Observe, in Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, a recurring theme is the distinctiveness of the believer. So we're going to read Matthew 5, 43 to 48, and we're going to circle you and your, and then we're going to read the whole thing again. So okay. Let me see. I think we have to flip the page on this one too. All right. Okay. Sure. Okay. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to risk, rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore you are to be perfect as your Father, Heavenly Father is perfect. Okay, let's go back because we're reading this again and uh, we are going to underline the instruction that Jesus gave. Okay, so begin again. I got my underline tool. You have heard that it was said, you shall love now, just your wait a neighbor. Minute. Yeah, so we're going to say when it says, but I say to you, that's where we're going to start. My yeah, number. okay, sub so your neighbor yeah. and hit your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why? So that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. Why? For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Why? For if you, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Okay, so that that seems pretty... Uh, pretty uh, uh, Unattainable there at the end, but we're going to talk about this. According to verse, okay, I'm going to go back. From what we read in verses 44 and 45, what specifically what does Jesus want his followers to do and why? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. One, two. Um, <clears throat> why is that? So that we may be sons of the of the of our Father in heaven. Wow! And and so, um, what is the thing that we remember about those we're praying for? God's attitude towards them. 
God, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the right, unrighteous and righteous. That's people. Righteous and so that's not evil deeds. That's people. That's talking about he, yeah. the evil and the good. He, yeah, yeah. The son, yeah. Because uh, here we are. We live on the planet. <laughs> and the sun rises and sets and the rain falls. Okay. All right. According to verse 48, as believers, what should our goal be? To be perfect like God is perfect. Yes. Uh, we're not going to get there, but that doesn't mean we don't try. That's right. Taking into consider all you have studied so far, what should our standard of living be? Explain our answer. To live like Christ as as best as we can like Christ. Because mm -hmm. we're not perfect. No, we're not perfect, but we're headed that way. Yes. Making it our goal to be that way. Since we are learning the practice of holiness, how are we to respond to those we're naturally inclined to hate? <clears throat> Some people have got certain flags flying around Canada concerning our prime minister. Is that how believers are supposed to behave? No. No. Um, but what about those who persecute us? The ones who are beating us up on social media, the ones who are calling us names. Are we supposed to hate those people too? No, we're supposed to pray for them. That's good. All right. The question at the very last here, the rubber hits the road. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, examine yourself. Are you growing in holiness? Understanding more about God and his ways? Is the fruit of the spirit evident in your life? Well, that's where the rubber hits the road. <clears throat> and I'm going to read the last part, the wrap up session, and then I'm going to pray. Oops. The practice of holiness leaves little room for personal comfort or even personal concern. Our practice of holiness is to be God-centered and people-focused. We are not to be distracted by selfish concern. We are to be holy as he is holy. Each aspect of the fruit of the Spirit is seen in relation to others. In fact, the only way to prove that holiness even exists in our lives is to live it out in relationship with others. The practice of holiness would be easy if it weren't for the people we all have to interact with. That prompts us to leave you with a challenge. Close today by praying through the fruit of the Spirit, asking God to produce this fruit in your own life. But please understand, the moment you do this, He will begin a process in your life of causing you to die to your own self-centeredness and training you to practice holiness by putting him first, all others second, and yourself a distant third. Are you up for the challenge? Oh, Father, taking ourselves, our minds, our hearts, our own wills into hand is not easy. And so that's why we're asking you, to grow us in love, your love, self-sacrificing for the benefit of the one who is loved. Lord, we want to grow in the fruit of joy, which is a deep inner rejoicing that doesn't depend on our circumstances. Father, we beg you. We beg you for your peace. Grow us in that fruit of inner quietness, even in the face of difficult circumstances. And Lord, teach us patience. Grow our patience, our crop of patience, which is long-suffering and self-restrained when provoked. We ask that you increase our fruit of kindness, which is a disposition our in ourselves that is mellow but not harsh and cutting. We're asking, Lord, that you would increase in us goodness doing good to others, even when it's not at all deserved. Father, make us faithful people. Grow us in our faithfulness to be trustworthy and reliable as your 
ambassadors and witnesses in the world. We need you, Lord, also to help us with gentleness, to use our power correctly and our authority, authority rightly. Train us to be considerate of others, even when discipline is needed at times. And Father, grow us also in our self-control. Show us how to control our own actions, our feelings, and our impulses and all of that. We do want to reflect you, Lord Jesus, in the world around us. We want to walk in the light as you are in the light. We want to be the light of the world as you said we are. And so we invite you to do whatever it takes to accomplish that and to produce in us much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.